On this edition of Autofocus, we take a drive down memory lane as we get a personal tour of the Chrysler Museum located in Auburn Hills, Michigan. We'll also get to meet one of the four-wheeled stars of Clint Eastwood's film, Gran Torino. And we'll wander the floor of Cobo Hall as we meet some of the legends from the world of car customizing as they greeted fans at the 2009 Detroit Autorama. Walter P. Chrysler Museum, located in Auburn Hills, Michigan, opened its doors in the fall of 1998, giving the Chrysler Corporation a place to store and display some of its more important and unique cars from its rich history. Everything from historic cars to concept cars. As they uh, enter the museum proper, they're going to run into the early days of the corporation. Uh, our roots, the very first year for Chrysler, Dodge, DeSoto, and all the different divisions. Uh, it's really set up chronologically as you th tour through the first and second floors. Um, it'll take you from 1902 uh, right up to current concept cars. So we, we try to rotate those in and out as often as possible. Uh, and then you take an elevator down to our garage level, which is a, kind of an eclectic mix of race cars, muscle cars, trucks and Jeeps, and you know, a little bit of everything. Uh, we've had a very diverse history, so we try and show a little bit of everything. Brant Rosenbush, the museum's vehicle collection administrator, gave Autofocus a tour of the facility, pointing out some of the more interesting and unique cars on exhibit, starting with the 1924 B70, one of the first four prototype Chrysler cars ever built. Uh, the vehicle behind me is one of the most significant vehicles we have in the museum. Um, it is a B70. That 70 uh, was actually the miles per hour it could reach at the time. This vehicle is built on a Maxwell chassis because it is a prototype. Mr. Crusher was running Maxwell at the time. Um, for the, its time, it was very low and uh, more set down towards the road than many other vehicles. Uh, you can compare it to some of the other vehicles that are close to its era here in the museum. They're much taller and boxier. Uh, so it was really a, kind of a low, sleek vehicle. Uh, it came with a high compression engine, which was uh, big for the time. It was more efficient engine, burned fuel more efficiently. Um, and 70 miles per hour was a big deal for the, the day, um, especially on the roads that they were driving on. Uh, it also was the first production vehicle to have four-wheel hydraulic brakes, a huge safety advance at the time because people were really running on two-wheel mechanical brakes, which really was not a good way to stop or very efficient at all. Some people noticed that the, uh, the chrome on the car isn't very bright because it's not chrome, it's nickel plated. They hadn't come out with chrome yet. That didn't come out until 1927. So uh, people, when they're visiting, they, they say we need to polish it, and it's, it's not the case. So um, this car's always been within the corporation. It's never been sold. Uh, we don't know what happened to the other three. They got out there in the world somewhere, but uh, it's a very, very significant vehicle. The vehicle behind me is a 1934 Chrysler Airflow. Um, Chrysler called it the first modern automobile when it came out, and it truly was. Um, the engineers at Chrysler redesigned the car from bottom up. Um, it's got a tubular steel frame. Um, they moved the axles further out to give the passengers better ride. Um, so it was a much smoother uh, ride. It's the first vehicle designed in a wind tunnel. Um, so that right there is pretty significant. Actually, Orville Wright and Wilbur Wright helped design the wind tunnel with uh, our engineers uh, to design this vehicle. Um, like I said, this is the 34, it came out, that, that's the first year. Um, the last year of the airflow was 1937. Um, as far as advanced it was, it wasn't a sales hit. Um, it was a little too radical for its time. Again, like I said, it has a tubular steel frame and it's an all steel body. And we have actually have film of this being rolled over a cliff and it rolling end over end three times. Uh, they came up, opened and closed all the doors, rolled up and down all the windows, started the car and drove it away. So it's a solid, strong vehicle. Well, this vehicle is one of our uh, the favorites of the visitors that come through here. It's a 53 Chrysler Special. Um, basically, it's a, a low production car derived from a concept car. In 1952, Chrysler introduced the Special as a concept car. It looked very, very similar to this. And it was such a sharp looking car, the president of export, Chrysler's export at the time, C.B. Thomas, said, can I have one of those? So they built one for him also. Um, it was actually designed here in the United States, but the body was be built by Ghia of Italy. Um, since Ghia had built two of them, they approached Chrysler and said, can we sell these um, in a limited version? 
and Chrysler agreed, so it's kind of a, you know, we supplied the engines and the frames for them. It's a 331 Hemi engine in here, um, and Gia went ahead and built a limited production of these. We think there's about 36 of them built. We only know of two or three here in the United States. Um, this was actually the last car we got right before we opened, two days before the museum opened, when this vehicle finally arrived. Um, and it's just a beautiful, it's very European in style, or, you know, influenced, but it was designed here uh, by Virgil Exeter in the United States. And it's just a very sharp, look, good looking car. Uh, the vehicle here is a 1961 Chrysler 300G. Uh, the 300 came out in 1955 and was assigned a letter with each uh, successive year. The 56 was a B and so on. This is kind of the height of the Findy era at Chrysler. Uh, this is the biggest year of the Finns, as a matter of fact, the last year, 1962, they're completely gone. Um, this was the gentleman's muscle car of the era. It was a, a, actually considered a sports car, even though it's so big, uh, kind of different times. They consider them different vehicles. Um, it's powered by a 413 cross ram induction engine uh, with dual four barrel carburetors. Um, we didn't have a Hemi engine back in 1961, we had dropped it. Uh, so the 413 was the largest engine you could possibly get. These vehicles were uh, uh, capable of doing well over 130 for extended lengths of period on the highway. Um, and it's also just the height of style, the, the details, the instrument panel, uh, it's got a dome on it. Um, just all the details in the car are just so wonderful. Uh, these vehicles are selling at auction for almost $200,000 now. Uh, it's just crazy because they're just so stylish. And I think that uh, 1961 300 convertible is probably the best looking car we ever built. And uh, we've had this vehicle here in the collection um, since about 1990. Okay, the vehicle behind me is something special from Chrysler Corporation. It's a 1963 Chrysler turbine car. Uh, Chrysler started working on the turbine engine in 1954 officially. The body was designed here in the United States, but built by Ghia of Italy. We had a long standing relationship with Ghia to build our bodies. All, they built 50 of them. All of them were look identical. They're painted identical, trimmed identical, uh, nothing different on any of them. The engine is, is incredible, and we've got an engine here on display. It looks like, people think it looks like a washing machine or an old boiler or something. Um, basically what it is, is it has one spark plug for ignition. Um, it's air-cooled engine, and as the air moves through, the turbine blades spin around and generate power. Uh, and also heat. The engine actually runs at 1500 degrees. So they had to design a special exhaust because the first exhaust were melting asphalt behind the car. <laughs> when it drives, it sounds like people say a vacuum cleaner. Um, it's, it's a very unique, distinctive, high-pitched uh, whistle. When the program was done, because they were imported vehicles with the expensive vehicles, uh, to avoid huge tariff and tax uh, problems, the company had to destroy all but nine of them. So we have a uh, film of them running high lows through the sides of these vehicles. The corporation kept three. Uh, we've got one here in the museum, and the other two we take to shows and events throughout the year. Um, we drive them, uh, all three are running. We worked on the program up until 1979, and the, it just was never more efficient than a uh, gas combustion engine. It was as efficient but more expensive to manufacture. So that's why it just never uh, made it to market. Uh, the vehicle we have here is 1982 M4S. It was a dual purpose vehicle or several purposes. Um, it was a test bed for Chrysler and some aerodynamic use. They actually tried to lower the drag coefficient of this vehicle to the lowest possible level. It was used at the PPG uh, racing series as a pace car for several years. And it was also used in a Charlie Sheen movie called The Wraith. Uh, it's got a very popular following on the internet and around the world um, on this one particular vehicle. Uh, in the archives, we get calls and letters every week about it. Um, they actually made uh, several more of these. I've heard different numbers on exactly how many. So it's actually on, I think, uh, 82 Dodge Chargers chassis at that time uh, when they wrecked them. So um, no real cars were hurt in the making of the movie. <laughs> It's, it's a very neat vehicle. Um, it opens up like a transformer almost where the front and the back open up uh, all sorts of ways. It's got the gullwing wing doors. Um, it's powered by a twin 2.2 uh, turbo engine. And actually one of the goals with the vehicle was to break the 200 mile an hour mark on a 2.2 uh, liter engine. Uh, they didn't quite do it. They hit, hit up to 198 uh, point, I think seven or something. 
So it was almost there, but it was uh, a natural test vehicle for Chrysler that was at, you know, they were able to use in other uh, uses too. Uh, what we have here is a 1970 Dodge Super V. Let alone being one of the coolest muscle cars with the best front ends, in my opinion, uh, the Chrysler ever built. Uh, this, this car has a per pretty neat story behind it. Um, about eight years ago, I received a phone call from a trade school in Indiana and said, we've got this car down here that you guys gave us in 1970 uh, to work on, and you can either take it back or we'll have to crush it. I said, well, what is it? And they said, a uh, 383 four-speed Super B. So we pretty much got in the truck and drove straight there to get it. Um, when we picked it up, it was a pretty well beat up vehicle. It had been in a trade school. Um, it had been taken apart and put back together a couple times, I believe. Uh, the seats were wrong in it. Um, and it. It had kind of a rough life, but it had less than 400 original miles on it. Uh, so we brought it back down here to uh, Detroit and finished it in our shops. The, one of the neat things on the car, it's B5 blue, but it, it, even after all these years, it had had the original build sheet uh, or behind the back seat, which is, was incredible that it was there. Probably less than 10 of these like this were built. Uh, and then again, this car, um, less than 400 miles on it. And we were lucky enough that the folks over at Mopar, uh, our aftermarket parts group, um, supply many of these parts. So this is kind of their showpiece that goes off to the Mopar shows, whether it's the, the dog dish hubcaps, the wood grain inlay that's on the inside of it, uh, the wipers, a lot of different things, the, the bees themselves and the seed stripes are all things that Mopar supplies. So it kind of worked out great. That, um, got a free car, got some free parts, and got some free help, and, and uh, got a car put together, and it's just a really neat vehicle. At Detroit's International Auto Show, it's the concept cars that generate a lot of excitement, and the museum has several Chrysler concepts on display including a few that were so popular they became production models. Our earliest concept cars we have here are from 1941 and they are built just to draw dealership traffic. This was before the auto shows came around much. Um, so those were built just for dealership traffic. The modern uh, concept cars, the ones you see now and for the last 20 or 30 years, they're really design exercises. They're a, a chance for us to let our designers go crazy. Uh, do something radical, but from those cars, they'll take the grill, um, they'll take the headlight pattern, or the basic outline of the vehicle, um, whether it be its height, its width, or something like that, and integrate those into the passenger cars, the ones you can buy. Um, but it's really just a chance for the designers to be creative, you know, think out of the box, um, and really, but we do try and bring some of those into the um, uh, passenger car market. One of the uh, exceptions to the rule was the 1989 Dodge Viper. We built that as just for a concept car for the Detroit Auto Show, but the reaction was so good to it that we ended up building the Viper and are still building the Viper today. After revisiting the history of Chrysler, one can't help but wonder about the present and future state of the company, given the economic woes faced by the entire automotive industry. Well, right now, uh, as everybody's been reading the newspaper and seeing on television, the whole industry is having a lot of problems. Um, we're doing what we can to get through those problems. Um, we, you know, we've, we're working with the government and um, putting together a master plan. Um, I know that uh, a lot of the people, folks over in design right now are really busy designing some pretty cool things. And you know, the whole company, everybody that's here, is, is gearing up towards getting through the uh, economic downturn. It really, I think, it would help if some of the folks from Washington came in and looked around and see what, what the auto industry has given to society as a whole. I think it would make a big difference. The museum is open six days a week. Its hours are 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Tuesday through Saturday and noon to 5 p.m. on Sundays. For more information, visit www.chryslerheritage.com. Clint Eastwood was in the metro Detroit area to direct and star in the movie Gran Torino. Upon its release, Gran Torino went on to become a smash hit, grossing over $140 million domestically with a total worldwide gross of over $200 million. The task of securing vehicles for the film went to Don Ripple of Maybe, Michigan, who perused the internet looking for suitable vehicles. Yeah, I have a friend in California, my best friend, he's Clint Eastwood's transportation coordinator, and he called me and knew he was coming to Michigan and wanted me to help him out on this, on this show. 
With Clint Eastwood's approval, Don traveled to Utah to purchase the 1972 Gran Torino of the movie's title. Actually, uh, Clint and his staff really caught their eye. Um, it's just, just a Gran Torino. It's a, it was a nice car. We didn't have to do a whole lot to it. We had the bumpers re and some little cosmetic stuff done to it, but basically it's, that's, that's the way we bought it. Don secured most of the other vehicles seen in the film as well, including this white Honda used by the movie's gang members. It was shipped in from California. Don also traveled to Bowling Green, Kentucky to buy this rusty 1972 Ford pickup truck with its distinctive white and gray paint scheme. Even though the story revolves around the Gran Torino, the pickup truck gets more screen time since it's Walt Kowalski's everyday driver. You had a truck picked out, but Clint didn't like it. Tell me that story. Yeah, I had a 95 uh, Ford picked up, picked out, and it was just a little too new, I guess, and wasn't, uh, he wanted something a little more downscale. Mm -hmm. So when you saw, did you see pictures of this online before you went out and saw it in person? Yes, we did. And then we showed uh, Clint, and he was interested in it, so we went and bought it. Right. Now, when you went out and bought it, was it, was it running? Was everything fine with it? Was there anything you had to do to it? Pretty much the interior was uh, somebody had tried to customize the interior a little bit, so we put all the stock interior back in it, tuned it up, and did a few things to it and got it ready so it would be dependable for the show. In addition to providing the vehicles, Don worked on set for three and a half months from prep to finish. I was hired in as a picture car mechanic and helped transport the cars and was on set to move cars around and work on them and whatever needed to be done. You know, it's, it's a job to everybody there, so, you know, you just stay in the background. The only, the only problem we really had, the battery went dead once, and that was, that was like a, a big issue. Because <laughs> uh, they, they needed to film? Yeah, they was filming. He, he pulled it around and uh, shut it off, and it wouldn't start, so everybody was running then. <laughs> that was the only problem we had with the truck. So all it's on you at that time? <laughs> yeah, it was all on me. It was all on me then. What did you do, swap out the battery, or...? Yeah, we swapped out. We swapped out the battery real quick because they had to do a, a few more shots. We didn't have time to charge it, but we had all that stuff just sitting there, sort of anticipating something would happen. As Don awaits the call to provide period vehicles for the next major production to come to Michigan, he hopes to sell the cars used in Gran Torino. The Gran Torino was purchased by Clint Eastwood and is currently on display at the Warner Brothers Studios in California. As for the pickup truck, well, it's up for sale. Well, it would be nice to to go into you know a museum or something like that but I don't know if it's that important of a truck to do that um, not really it's just an old truck to me Hottest hot rods, custom cars, and vehicles from past and present were on display at the 2009 Detroit Autorama. Over 1,000 exhibits were enjoyed by gearheads and the just plain curious folks who enjoy seeing these vehicles up close and personal. The Autorama has a long history in Detroit and was the first paying customer at Coble Hall more than 50 years ago. The Autorama is the hot rod guys. These are the guys with the street machines, the muscle cars, the hot rods the customs that take these cars and rework them, make them very personal, their own thing. Where the new car show is a show strictly on the new and upcoming stuff. But it's funny, we get a lot of people attend this show from the big three that look at colors and look at designs and get a lot of ideas for the new cars. The cars are handpicked by a committee every year with the goal of providing an interesting variety for spectators. The cars on display are also judged in various categories and awards are handed out on the last day of the event. The cars that do come to Autorama are a lot of the cars you see in the magazines and see on TV, like Chip Foose has a car here again this year, and, and, it's, and uh, Troy Trapani has cars. Which the big builders are here, but also we have the home builders here. That's what makes it fun. Michigander Dave Schutten had several amazing custom cars on display, including the Orbitron, originally designed and built by the late Ed Big Daddy Roth. Schutten restored it after it was found being used as a dumpster in Mexico. 
completely destroyed. It was missing from the, the setback headlights forward. All that part of the body, the hood, the bubble, and all that was gone. It was completely destroyed. And uh, I spent about four and a half months out in L.A. restoring this car to where you see it now. How do you, how do you even find out its location, and, and how does it wind up in your possession? Well, it's, it's really pretty wild. Um, a good friend of mine, Michael Lightborn from El Paso, Texas, he's known as like the, uh, the West Texas scout. He just finds all this stuff. And he actually sends out disposable cameras to some people in Mexico. They take pictures of random cars, he gets them back, and then he goes and investigates. So That's this, how... this is brought to your attention and you instantly recognize it as being one of Roth's? Correct, yeah. There's a, he only builds one of each of his cars, or built one of each of his cars. And uh, yeah, we've been looking for this for 20 years. The legendary George Barris was also in attendance, but instead of being surrounded by his famous cars from film and television, Barris was eager to show off several cars customized by himself and his brother Sam, who passed away in 1967. Barris refers to these cars as the legend cars and includes Sam's 1949 Mercury, the Hirohata Merc, built by George and Sam for Robert Hirohata in 1951, and a la carte built in 1957 from a 1929 Ford pickup truck. Of course, I was fortunate to pioneer customizing back in the 40s when I was doing my very first car, which was a 1925 Buick, which I had to be able to customize. So, But of course, from there, I was generated with my brother and I. We went into the chopping the Mercury's and sectioning the shoe boxes, and we had a lot of fun pioneering many of these cars that you see here. And like the three cars right here, my brother's very first Merc, that 49 over there, the green one. He bought it at a dealership, had five miles on it, drove it into the shop. We ripped out all the upholstery, took all the glass out, took the hacksaws to it, and he didn't even have five miles on the car. <laughs> and then we have the uh, Hirohata Mercury, was the very first one that had many unique changes. And then, of course, the Grand National Roadster window right here, the Alla car we built for Richard Peters, our dear friend from Fresno, right over here also in our booth and uh, it's kind of an honor for me to be here. I've been a legend and tributed here with many of our cars, but uh, it turns out that Detroit and the Autorama is probably the number one custom car show and I would say in the world, not only the USA now, because the selection of cars and the talent that's here can never ever be equal in any other show. Even in the Grand National out at the West Coast, used to be in Oakland and went to, to Los Angeles, doesn't equal the Detroit Autorama that the uh, Larrabee and all the group has done. For decades, Barris has produced numerous cars for television and film out of his shop in North Hollywood, including the coach from the TV series, The Munsters. Of course, George Barris's most famous creation is the Batmobile, built in 1966 for the Batman TV series. The original is currently housed in the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles. Barris is still going strong, attending car shows like the Autorama. But when it's all said and done, we asked him how he would like to be remembered. I think the thing I enjoy more than anything, cars are wonderful, but people are better. So my biggest thrill is when people come up to me and shake my hand and say, gee, you know, you've done a great job on cars. So meet and greet and people is, is real and very realistic. And cars are fun to, and they're collectors, but people are the best. I was a 13-year-old boy that played with a craft that nobody was doing anything with. That means I was taking and doing cars. Now, I made that successful, and that only could be done and made in America and USA. Known as the Bubble Top King, Daryl Starbird was honored as the 2009 Builder of the Year at the Autorama. Daryl has been building and customizing cars for more than 55 years. Some of his incredible creations were on display, traveling to Detroit from his museum in Oklahoma. Well, it's a great honor here to be part of the big Autorama here. Of course, I've known about it my whole life, and uh, one of my many desires was to be Builder of the Year for a lot of years now. I always like to look ahead and do something different and, uh, you know, be not just copy the 50s look, although I enjoyed the 50s cars. The, the futuristic designs that you come up with, are you surprised that we don't see these in everyday street cars or do you understand the need for them to be more practical? Well, both actually. 
I am somewhat surprised because many of the cars I've developed over the years have been cars that could have very well have been used everyday situation. But also, I didn't have to, you know, deal with the problems of headroom, legroom, safety, and all that that Detroit designers have had to deal with. So I've had a complete freedom of expression, so to speak, or freedom of design. And when people come and you see them checking out your work, what does that mean to you? Well, of course, it gives me a great feeling that they appreciate what I've done. And, and like I say, I've tried to always do something different, not fall in any particular mode of, of design. So Monogram also did, you know, like 15 of my cars into model cars, and many for cop or developed off of the, the original car. And they, of course, gave me the opportunity to have more freedom of, of design because, you know, they had the money behind them to do it. And so I've been very lucky in that experience. And with that, we'll wrap up this edition of Autofocus. If you would like to see your car event featured on a future edition of Autofocus, send us an email at autofocus at cmntv.org. And we'll see you next time with more muscle, chrome, and wheels on Autofocus. Autofocus.